Hello, my audience. In the book, A Handbook for Right-Wing Youth by famous self-proclaimed aristocrat of the soul, Julius Evola, there is an essay. Well, the book is just a series of essays, but the CIA doesn't want you to know that. The essay this video is about is called Psychoanalysis of the Protest, which is also something the CIA doesn't want you to know. Remember the 2023 riots in France? Or the series of protests and church burnings in Canada after our radar found soil disturbances which were automatically assumed to be graves? Or the 2020 Summer of Sneed in which a country boy took away the breath of a city slicker? With no background knowledge, it's easy to assume that these kinds of hysterical outbursts are new. But they're not. Most Americans will be familiar with the periodic race riots which have become a feature of daily life since 1945. In May of 1968, there were huge protests in France which resemble quite strikingly the dumpster fires we see today. A peaceful show of force is better than immediately taking direct action. A violence is not always the answer, even if I would like it to be. But not all protests are equal. During the lockdown years, a very little coverage was given by the lying mainstream media to anti-lockdown protests. These weren't minor either. Canada and Germany in particular had weekly mass gatherings against the lockdowns. The propaganda arm of the government, which is the media, deliberately ignored these to stop awareness of them spreading. In contrast, the summer of 2020, which took my breath away, dominated the news cycle to such an extent that it was inescapable. The opinions of non-political spectators can be influenced by convincing them that popular sentiment is decisively on whichever side the lying media takes. Very few events are spontaneous. Real tribe members straight from the tunnels who organize these left-wing protests and the lying press that shines a spotlight on them literally work hand in hand. A good example of this is Daniel Cohn Bendit, a tunnel dweller. He was a student leader in the May 68 protests in France, whose consequences were to give unironic communist syndicates control of schools. Organizers like him are the ones who are seemingly able to create these protests out of thin air, giving the illusion of spontaneity. The life cycle of a protest is the same as any flavor of the month anime. For a while, they are able to spark general interest before fading away from public consciousness. Those of you watching this video five years from now probably won't remember who Fryron is. What can keep a specific movement alive for a long time is the deliberate intervention of a couple key coordinators. This is very important to recognize because it tells us that whichever issue shit lives are protesting is simply a mask. The problems that Occupy Wall Street was trying to bring attention to didn't just go away when the occupiers of Wall Street went home. In fact, they are more concerning than ever. The reason they stopped is because the CIA told them to. Ferocious, lipshit, fecal feasters don't need legitimate reasons to protest, like the deteriorating economic situation the working class is suffering. Instead, as has been the case in the UK, they protest for the emancipation of the international proletariat by giving minors access to HRT. The stated issues these activists show up for is just a pretext. Even those who show up for trans rights don't care about achieving their goal. Because of their lack of actual motive or objective, a leftist protest movement merits a psychoanalytical analysis instead of a cultural or political one. What is outwardly apparent is that the detestable, lipshit, dung devourers have an anarchical orientation and subsequently fight against all forms of oppression, real or imagined. But that doesn't examine the base impulses that lead these movements, which is the domain of psychoanalysis. A common theme that is present in practically all of their protests is the ongoing struggle against the patriarchal system, hierarchy, and authority. As far as I know, famous Austro-Hungarian psychiatrist Sigmund Freud didn't write about protests. However, Freud's theory of the Oedipus Complex does give a useful lens to analyze this with. The Oedipus Complex is as follows, a revolt against one's own father with the desire to do away with him and replace him. This complex isn't as simple as wanting to put your dad six feet under, but having admiration and envy of him. And here is a problem. A very few, if any, protests can be explained by sinful, lipshit, shit swallowers having daddy issues because they have no admiration for patriarchal authority, and they don't want to have the same power as a paternal autocrat since they have a true aversion to any form of aristocracy or hierarchy which would give a distinct group of people a set of privileges and roles from birth. Evil, excrement-enjoying shitlibs don't want to obtain aristocratic privileges, they want to destroy all inequalities. The great majority of countries in the world are ruled by feminine principles seeking to govern through consensus rather than following the vision of a paternal autocrat like Tsar Alexander III. In Russia, the paternal aspect was made explicit as the Tsar was seen as the little father, the vice-regent of Christ. 
The big fault. Even Faker's nefarious number two nibbling lipshits like to decry as semi fascist, like Putin or Viktor Orban, frame themselves as populists, executing the will of the people, ultimately deriving their sovereignty not from God or any higher principle, but from the unenlightened masses who cannot make the judgment call and whose voices should not be heard at all. Far right populists are still maternal figures. And because they have genuine disdain for any authority, a left wing protests are hysterical, uncontrolled, natural disasters. Plato, pronounced Play Doh said that those who have no master inside them ought to have a master outside them. The social conventions, social practices, or institutions imposed on us from the outside aren't repressive in themselves, but can give organization to our lives if we don't have any law, form, or discipline within ourselves. However, these structures can become genuinely oppressive if they don't ever change or, as is more often, become corrupt. And taking action against decaying or dead structures is not bad, but in order to acquire the legitimacy to tear down these structures, to quote Evola, you must show that it's not simply a matter of aversion towards all forms of inner discipline, but rather of yearning for a more genuine life. He continues, What we observe instead are individuals identifying with the instinctive, irrational, and amorphous part of man, its underground, at that part which in every higher human being is not stubbornly repressed, but rather held at a certain distance and in check. The links between the protest movement and the most spurious and promiscuous aspects of the so-called sexual revolution are certainly revealing, as is the spectacle offered by the many sectors in which the repressive system is increasingly being replaced by a permissive one. A contemptible, caca-consuming lipshits want to enjoy an amorphous personal freedom, total emancipation from all responsibilities and prescribed social roles. When Evola wrote this in 1970, there were still some structures left. Today, the permissive system has totally supplanted everything. Even the most common and simple test of discipline, going to mass every Sunday, is something that's rarely practiced by anyone under the age of 65. As an aside, liberal revolutionaries like the American founders have the same founding principles as the modern left. The 1776 revolution may have initially been about taxation, but equality before the law and popular sovereignty quickly dissolved its supposed unfair privileges and duties of the aristocracy. Of course, the path of equalization didn't stop there. The distinctions between biological genders are also an inequality. The effort to equalize men and women has been so successful that many people believe there's basically no differences between the genders, therefore justifying the transgender. This is another way of saying that gender-neutral bathrooms are a natural consequence of 1776. Yes, I will always find a way to fit anti-Americanism into every video I make. You're welcome. As mentioned earlier, Occupy Wall Street had rightful grievances. Many centrists believe their cause was just, but I don't. A berserk, lipshit, booty bomb banqueters, or social democrats may point to real issues like economic decline, but because of their irrational and sub-intellectual drive for total emancipation, any victory that they could achieve would only drag us, to quote Evola again, to an even more critical and destructive stage than the one which existed at the start. Another way to view deplorable, difficult dining lipshits is through Carl Gustav Jung's theory of the collective unconscious. In short, and to oversimplify it, Jung believed that certain complexes exist within everyone and can resurface given the correct conditions. These shared complexes aren't called complexes, they're called archetypes. Once the archetype has taken hold, it can carry someone away. The archetype that may explain protest movements is the puer eternus, Latin for eternal boy, and I will just say eternal boy because that's easier. This archetype represents the pre-conscious and instinctual aspect of the collective unconscious. In Jungian psychology, archetypes have a positive and negative side. The positive of the eternal boy is the potential for renewal and restoration. The negative, as we see all too often today, is the man-child who refuses to grow up. It's sufficient to say that the image Hollywood would like to portray is the positive side. The idea that they are putting away outdated symbols and institutions, brushing aside the out-of-touch old generation and paving the way for authentic change. Garish guano gobblers are portrayed as visionaries, creators, and artists. Nothing could be further from the truth. They are petulant children obsessed with novelty and change for the sake of change. As seen by their failure, to create new structures, they are incapable of creating anything new. When you take away the mythologized aspect of the eternal boy, that being the eternal part of it, what you're left with is a bunch of children with nothing constraining their most absurd and destructive desires. That is the psychology of the modern protest. Remember Daniel Cohn-Bendit from earlier? I wouldn't blame you, 
I don't either. In 1976, he offered an article describing in graphic detail minor touching encounters with minors when he was a school teacher in Frankfurt. Later, Cohen Bendit became a member of the German Green Party and was elected to the European Parliament. What's important is that well adjusted people like children, but some people like children a little too much, and those people are overrepresented in positions of power. This is going to sound crazy, but I believe this is 100% true. The reason minor touching, and yes, I'm using a euphemism because YouTube doesn't like the proper name for what I'm describing, will eventually be normalized by law and therefore society is the fetishization of youth. Since the 1960s, the media has been pushing the line that instead of teaching children, we should learn from them. This is seen in child activists the media props up like Greta Thunberg or Malala. Consequently, if children are more knowledgeable and wise than adults, then they should have no problem with, you know, whatever happened on that island owned by that guy. Of course, this is still far in the future but it's necessary to recognize the extreme danger presented by this strain of thinking. This video is essentially the audiovisual format of psychoanalysis of the protest. The reason for making this video is because I believe Evola's works contain valuable ideas that need to be spread, especially for anyone on the so-called dissonant right, and nobody today reads. I recommend you read the essay, it was republished in A Handbook for Right-Wing Youth. I will make a video for every essay in that book, then I will make a video for every chapter of The Bowen Club by Evola, then maybe I will revolt against the modern world. Also, I have a Twitter if you want to follow me there. More importantly, I have a Fediverse account, basically a decentralized Twitter clone. I also have channels on Rumble and Odyssey. Typically, I will upload videos on Rumble and Odyssey a week before I upload them to YouTube. Like, comment, and subscribe because for sure you want to see more Evola videos.